We want bread, and roses too. The Bread and Roses Strike of 1912. The female leadership in the Bread and Roses Strike of 1912 explored their role in the greater labor movement and encountered injustice based on their gender. Yet the movement was able to exchange ideas of industrial unity, which led to the improvement in the treatment of workers and leaving behind labor liberty. Better to starve fighting than to starve working. 1912 was a large part of what was known as the Progressive Era. William Howard Taft had been elected president in 1909. In a time when age expectancy was low and infant mortality rates were high, citizens were motivated to fight for better living conditions as well as a healthier population. During this era, people were determined to change and reform every aspect of society and economy. Unfortunately, it was difficult for women to provide their opinions on these national changes. Women had few rights and primarily worked at home. They were not allowed to vote and were forbidden to own property. The husband was in charge. A white Protestant man was the epitome of an American. Like women, immigrants and African Americans were disrespected, violently harmed, and restricted of American rights. These groups of people faced segregation every day of their lives. Lawrence, Massachusetts, being a city of profitable industrial goods, hired thousands of these men and women to work in the factories, no matter what race or gender. There were 30,000 workers in the woolen mills, and approximately half were women, and the rest were mostly immigrants. These immigrants helped shape the culture of Lawrence, transforming it into a successful textile city. You know, without immigrants, would there have been Lawrence? And then the answer to that question is no. At the start of the 20th century, Lawrence produced more than 25% of wool cloth for the country. Especially in the workplace, mostly factories, conditions were poor and human rights were ignored. Conditions were so poor that people would die within the first year or two working. It was extremely crowded and full of diseases, with no windows for air filtration and running machines that would constantly put lives in danger. 52% of wages in Lawrence came from the factory employment. 22,000 of the workers were paid an average of $8.76 for a full week of work. Early in 1912, a state law was passed that limited the amount of hours women could work to 54 hours a week from 56 hours a week. The low salary and poor working conditions of the Lawrence factories provoked the employees to fight for better wages and conditions. If you were a recent immigrant, you would be paid less than an immigrant who would have been living in the country for a longer time. The wages depended on gender, nationality, age, and your social status. Immigrants, however, encouraged the strike to take place because if the mills did not grow in employment, the strike would have not been as powerful. The idea of a strike for the mill workers of Lawrence had been planned for a long time. This strike was not a spontaneous uprising. The IWW, or Industrial Workers of the World, organized meetings for many months before. At this time, unions were created to organize workers and help represent opinions on wages, hours, and working conditions. Joseph Eder, a leader of the Industrial Workers of the World, and Arturo Giovanetti, a leader of the Italian Socialist Federation, had been organizing meetings in Lawrence to better the working conditions of the mill workers. Eventually, on January 11th, a group of Polish women working in Lawrence, realizing their wages had been cut short, and yelled, short pay, all out, and walked out of the Everett Mill. The following day on the 12th, the mill workers at the Washington Mill had walked out due to cut pay. This led to the rest of Lawrence Mills following in the fight for rights. Many of these uprisings were led by determination of strong-willed women. One of these women was the leader of the strike, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. She was a full-time organizer for the IWW from New York. She, along with several women, Americans and immigrants alike, marched along the streets with picket signs and hat pins for weapons, boycotting the mills. The mill workers wanted their wages to be raised by 15% as well as better conditions. Together, immigrant and American citizen workers, mostly female, united together to fight peacefully for the rights they deserved. Unfortunately, the women in the strike encountered inequality based on their gender. Although the working conditions and wages for all employees was already poor enough, the women were not seen as equal laborers as the men and were paid less. Also, the IWW was the only organization to support this strike because they did not discriminate against the powerful role of women leading the strike. Unlike other organizations such as the AFL, who only helped white skilled male workers, the IWW believed in helping anyone who was considered an employee. American Federation of Labor, going back to them, their idea of, well, we can't organize women because mm -hmm. they're, they're not organizable. Mm -hmm. These women are defying even the labor movement's impression of who they are. The women also dealt with harassment from the police. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn recalls, 
As the terrible New England winter dragged along, the terror and violence increased. On February 19, 1912, policemen with drawn clubs routed 100 women picketers. Usually a nightstick well aimed brought the woman to the ground like a shot, and instantly the police would be on her, pulling her in as many ways as there were police. One woman striker named Anna Lapizzo was shot and killed on January 29th. Although the militia were to blame, the leaders of the strike, Arturo Giovanetti and Joseph Eder, were charged with the murder. Women strikers were faced with many challenges during their strike for more pay, including violence and aggression. Previous strikes, including the Pullman strike, was fought for better wages from the railroad company. The Haymarket riot in Chicago was fought for an eight-hour workday. Both strikes were dealt with by using military force ordered by the government. Even though women faced brutal harassment, the strike allowed an exchange in ideas to create industrial unity. Eventually, the government began listening to the strikers. One significant day was the congressional hearing of Camilla Tioli, a 14-year-old mill worker. Her scalp had been ripped off by the machines, and she was in the hospital for several months. Because the mills would not help pay her bills or compensate for her injury, she testified against them. Her story attracted the attention of First Lady Helen Taft. Horrified by the treatment of the little girl, Helen Taft ordered her husband to do something. Taft donated money to the strike in order to promise better wages. After many hard months of fighting for higher wages, the women and men won the fight, succeeded in achieving their demands, and in negotiated wages with the factory owners. During the strike, women and immigrants of many nationalities band together to fight for what they believed in. Women had no say in the government, and this group of women overcame all the stereotypes and proved to the United States that any gender or race can come together and fight for rights. The Bread and Roses strike was immediately successful and it strengthened the movement of workers and laborers into organizing unions and committees. The workers received what they demanded, a 15% raise as well as better conditions. The strike also started momentum towards universal and specific workers' rights and living wages. They achieved an agreement close to their original demands, including significant pay raises and a time and a quarter for overtime, which previously had been paid at the straight hourly rate. Also, Edder and Giovanetti were released from their charges on the murder of Anna Lupizzo. In 1920, the 19th Amendment was enacted, stating that women had the right to vote. This strike triggered women to be more confident and stand up for what they believe in. Today, women make up approximately 70 to 90 percent of the labor force in the global textile industry. Although they have received increased access to employment and new opportunities, the jobs they earn can be very unregulated, unfair, and unstable. Sexual harassment or violence in the workplace can be very common. With minimum wages paid that typically are half to one-third of the living wage, most textile workers can hardly provide for the daily bread for their families. Production quotas are high and extremely hard to meet. Workers who don't reach the target are often forced to do overtime without additional pay. When workers stand up for their rights and seek to organize to form a union, many times they are fired. Today, workers are still far from getting the most basic dignity and respect. Lawrence remains a city of somewhat working poor, including substandard housing, high unemployment rates, political corruption, and troublesome street crime. Although not condemned to factory work at an early age, children struggle to learn under the tenement-like conditions. Today, there are still some issues involving wages in the working class and discrimination based on gender. According to the Institute for Women's Policy Research, in 2014, female full-time workers made only 79 cents for every dollar earned by men. At Walmart, the typical woman working in retail makes $10.58 an hour, about $4 less than her male counterpart. On June 4th in Chicago, women walked off their jobs at Walmart and stood outside the stores holding signs saying, Walmart wages hurt America. Even though the strike did not receive an immediate effect for better wages, in June of 2015, Walmart raised their wages ranging from $13 to $25. The Bread and Roses strike was for the Women of Lawrence, a call to action on the injustice of gender inequality as well as segregation of different races. Women of different ethnicities and different languages were able to unite together to create this strike. With the help of Arturo Giovanetti, Joseph Eder, the rebel girl Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, and the workers of Lawrence Mills, the workers received the wages, conditions, and rights they deserved. Although there is a large amount of work to be done in order for women to earn the money they deserve, the Bread and Roses strike opened the eyes of people about the problem of wages and working conditions. The dedication and courage of these young women will forever leave their mark in labor history. As we go marching, marching in the beauty of the day.